Hi everybody, I'm Jay Weatherburn for those who I have not met yet and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you today to this monthly meetup for the Australasia Preserves Community of Practice. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I am today, the land of the Wurundjeri, and pay respect to the elders past and present. We extend that respect to traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to land, sea and community, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. A note for everybody that this session is being recorded and it will be going up on the Oz Preserves YouTube channel. A quick note on timing as well. We did have an hour for this session originally, but we have four really great speakers and we thought instead of having to smush it all into one hour, we've extended it slightly uh, to an hour and a half here today. We do have a code of conduct for the community. Australasia Preserves is a very diverse community from a very wide range of social, cultural and professional backgrounds. So we do ask everybody to take a look at the link that is here on the slide. And we do ask everyone to bring a spirit of respect and friendly inquiry to all of our interactions. So in that spirit of creating a good community, it is helpful if you have an identifiable name on Zoom. There is a participants button down the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can click on that and work out how to rename yourself. If you can't work it out, do call out in the chat box and someone will talk you through it. To help with any bandwidth issues today, we're gonna turn off our videos while the speakers are on and we'll turn them on again when we get to question and discussion time. Using the chat function, please say hello, introduce yourself, say hi. Call out if there's any technical issues as we go, ask questions as we go so we can get straight into discussion. Our meetup today is focused on emulation. Um, so we've got four guest speakers um, and there's been quite a lot of discussion on the Australasia Preserves Forum recently about emulation. So this is my cue to throw to Matthew Burgess, who is going to introduce the topic for us in a little more detail before we hear from our speakers. So over to you, Matt. So providing access to born digital material is a consistent challenge across galleries, libraries, archives and museums. It was a common discussion point on my research trip across the United Kingdom last year, where copyright, access rights and technical challenges often stand in the way of access. Today's discussion stems from a post on the Australasia Preserves Google Group seeking options for web-based viewers for born digital materials other than images and AV, which are readily available with open source and commercial solutions. Viewing born digital materials online becomes complicated when working with other file formats such as emails, computer design, video games, and even older word processing formats. There's also the question on whether to provide access through a web browser or, as is the practice with some digital archives, provide a downloaded legacy formats for researchers to render in their own computing environment. Emulation is defined in the Digital Preservation Handbook as a means of overcoming technical, technological obsolescence of hardware and software by developing techniques for imitating obsolete systems on future generations of computers. There's a lot of interesting work happening in this space, which we're going to hear about today. I'm particularly interested in how this could be utilised in the Australasian region. Over to Ewan. I'm Ewan Cochran. I'm the Digital Preservation Manager at Yale University Library. I'm a Kiwi um, and I'm currently stuck in New Zealand thanks to the pandemic, uh, which is not the worst place to be. Um, and I've worked in uh, Archives New Zealand, Statistics New Zealand and Deloitte in Melbourne, Australia. So there's a bit of um, background in Australasia. Um, but I'm based in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm the PI on the Emulation as a Service uh, Infrastructure Program of Work. I've actually just added um, Seth Anderson, who's the Program Manager for this um, Program of Work, um, as a co-PI for the next round, um, which started in July this year. So I'll just share my screen. I can't share my screen. Um, you might need to unshare. Uh, is that Jay or Matt? I'm getting a message saying I can't share my screen. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Should be good now. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm at Yale and I'm Easy PI. Um, so what is Easy? It stands for Emulation as a Service Infrastructure. And what we're trying to do is scale up access to um, software, uh, 
preservation and emulation infrastructure, including distributed management, sharing, documentation access, um, and discovery tools. But I thought I'd start by showing a quick video of what this is. Um, so what it enables you to do is access emulators via a web browser. And what we're gonna see here is um, a emulator computer that's been set up to rerun a um, packaged uh, research project that was packaged using the Reprozip software. Now, Reprozip is a way of uh, packaging up all the dependencies of a project that might, a digital project of some sort. In this case, uh, this is, I think, about um, school funding for um, materials in schools in, I think, maybe New York. Um, and I'll skip through this video because can take a little while to load. Um, but essentially, um, what we're seeing here is a version of Ubuntu running in browser, uh, well, being accessed in browser, and we're seeing the Reprozip package um, run in that version of Ubuntu um, and be reproduced. Uh, and we'll see in just a minute that it's starting a Postgres server. So this is one of the dependencies of this project that's been packaged. and then I loaded up a, um, a web browser and uh, browsed to the website that is provided by this, this package of um, project work. Um, so then what you're able to do once you rerun a package like this is just interact with it like you would have originally using the original um, software in um, software that was in an operating system that was contemporary to the one that it was um, created in. So you can see this is a, a web-based project that allowed you to look at um, textbook um, uh, availability in schools around um, America. I think it was New York though. Anyway, hopefully this shows um, the kind of thing that we can do. So we can take um, any old digital objects and make them accessible in the original software and browser. So EASY is uh, based on the emulation as a service infrastructure, sorry, the emulation as a service um, software that was developed out of the University of Freiburg. And Emulation as a Service packages up a whole lot of different emulators and makes them all accessible through a standard uh, single uh, programming interface and via a web browser. These are um, some of the emulators that are available in Emulation as a Service and EASY. Um, it also then allows you to create computers that run on those emulators um, and access them in your web browser and create um, new versions of computers by taking an existing one, making a change to it, like adding some software or adding some code, and then um, saving that as a derivative. And when you do that, you save a lot of storage space because all you're saving is the difference between the original and um, what you've changed. And then when you rerun that computer, it brings those two together. And so that's a, a huge saving over time when you're creating thousands of these environments or oh, emulated computers. The word we use for them is environment because it encompasses everything that goes into um, the emulated computer, including the software, the documentation, and the emulated hardware. So with EASY, we've taken that emulation to service software, and we're adding, um, uh, we're turning it into a network of organizations that are running the software and enabling them to uh, distribute um, emulated computers between them, so share computers between them. Um, because what we found was while emulation as a service is amazingly powerful, uh, when you go to use it, it's really difficult often to find the software that you want and to have all the knowledge that you need to be able to pre-configure that software in order to use it to access the actual content that you're trying to access. So you might have an old digital object saying, let's say in um, AutoCAD for DOS, and it could be quite difficult to find the right version of AutoCAD for DOS and to configure it and to document it so that um, other people could then use it in the future. So with EASY, we're making it so that only one person or at one organization needs to do that. They can save that environment and share it to the network and others in the network can just uh, replicate it to the local node and reuse it there. Within, um, so we're pre-populating the network at Yale with uh, at least 3000 um, software applications running in, in different environments and we're thoroughly documenting those. And we're incorporating some of the work we've been doing with Wikidata for Digital Preservation Portal at wikidp.org um, and contributing back as much metadata as we can to Wikidata, which is um, basically the Wikipedia for structured data. I recommend taking a look if, I'll share these slides afterwards and I recommend taking a look at um, those links, uh, especially the, the user link to the Wikidata page. There's a lot of amazing data that you can pull out from the queries that are linked in there. 
So this is the kind of thing we're documenting uh, for each environment. So we're documenting every single format that each op application opens and saves um, and exactly what it says in the software about what it opens and saves. And this allows us to power all sorts of additional services on top of um, that basic infrastructure. And one of the main ones we're gonna be powering through that is what we're calling um, the Universal Virtual Interactor, which in this slide is, is described as an API to automatically render objects in original software via emulation. And I'll talk a little more about that. But first I'll just go through the other things that we've got um, in, that we're providing on top of that basic infrastructure. So we're developing a way to share um, basically digital publications, which could be CD-ROMs or floppy disks or any old publication that many libraries might have. Um, and effectively what we're able to do is give a library um, a link to a, an old CD that they may have in their collections and make it so that the users can now access it via a web browser in the original operating system. So the, the most um, common example that everyone seems to understand is Encarta, but there are actually thousands of these kinds of um, digital publications that currently users um, or patrons and libraries really don't have any option for accessing because most of them, A, don't have a CD-ROM, and even if they do have a CD-ROM drive, they don't have the right software to open the um, content on the CD. Um, then I think what will be interesting to a lot of people here, I hope so, is this virtual reading room service. So the idea with this is that we're able to take a specific com emulated computer, or it might even be a virtualized computer running modern software, and dedicate it to a user for a period of time. So we can put some um, restricted access content in there with all the software that they might need to interact with it and provide it to the user to access for doing research on. And they can come back to it and they can go away and come back to that environment and have it be exactly the same as when they left. And we can potentially have them save or export content or print from it to PDF. And um, we can filter or review those before we pass them on to the Patreon in, in case there's some restricted content in them. So we, we see a lot of use um, coming from that particular service. It's not quite ready yet, but uh, we're hoping to launch it in the next sort of six to nine months. And um, I think um, there'll be a lot of interest, especially at this point in time, when it's very difficult to give access to um, special collections um, when everyone's working remotely. And then we're also doing some work around scientific software and kind of putting a filter on um, our collections that are pre-configured in the easy network to enable you to easily find um, scientific software and um, package up content scientific uh, projects and the content involved with them into a package that can be reused and re-accessed in the future. So getting back to the Universal Virtual Interactor, I think this is one of the most powerful and uh, most potentially applicable um, concepts or tools that we're building on top of the basic easy infrastructure. It's um, basically what we're trying to do is give you the ability to add a universal viewer or interactor to your um, access and discovery platforms. The idea being that you send it a digital object and you get back that object um, interactable in the original software in your web browser. So it's kind of like a PDF viewer um, is in web browsers today, but this is universal and that it could be applied to anything. So here's a demo. Um, so what you'll see here is I've uploaded a spreadsheet. It's an, I think, Excel version three spreadsheet. It might be newer. Um, and it's matching it to two different environments in Easy. One is Corel Word Perfect Suite, and the other is the Office Suite. And it, I chose to render it in Corel first to just show what that looks like. So I don't know how quick this is, but. What, what you see anyway is that it opens automatically. There's a little script that gets created and run automatically on um, boot up that will then open the application with that file open in it. And you can see it's open, you can interact with it. So you could look at the formula that might be in there. You can make changes if you want to. Those changes won't be saved unless we enabled someone to save them. But now we're seeing it opened in the other alternative software, which is um, gonna be Microsoft Excel in Office 97. And um, we should see the same thing happens. So it's going to open, it's going to run a script that opens the file automatically. And then I think the interesting thing about this example, which I just found in a test suite that the Open Preservation Foundation provides, um, is that there's actually different content presented when you open it in that second application. So you see that, that comment saying the uh, new sales office was opened. Also what we're seeing here is that you can actually save changes. So if you want to convert this to say a CSV, which, do, which is what we're seeing here, you can uh, enable that functionality for end users. They can save the different file and then they'll be given the option to download uh, whatever had been changed um, 
when they shut down the environment. So this could be quite transformative in that it could really enable access to a lot of things that are inaccessible today. Um, it works very much based on metadata. So we're matching um, information in the files to, uh, well, the files themselves or the digital objects to the computers that can open them and enable interaction with them. Um, we pull metadata out of the files to enable this, or we can take metadata and submit it to the API um, and not actually just submit the file um, and then get back a, a ranked list of environments that can open the object and interact with it. Uh, and you can interact with it through, through. And then as a developer, you can choose how you want to implement all of this. So you could implement it so that it's a single click. So the user just clicks on an object and it opens the highest ranked, it, it opens the object in the highest ranked software. Um, or you could present use, uh, options to the user so that they can um, choose which one they think is best or try them all out. And we're also developing at the moment a, a bunch of other implementations that rely on the same concept. Um, such as being able to potentially deep link into um, email running it in Outlook. Um, it uses a similar concept to this, which allows you to open um, the computer that's already got the Outlook um, mailbox in it, and uh, you can directly link into that email and, and see it open in the context of the inbox that's running there. Um, what, uh, in the demos I've shown so far, we, you saw the older uh, UI and um, user interface and we're currently, well we have now updated it um, and we're adding an awful lot of new uh, like user interface functionality so making it easy to discover, find, um, add metadata and do all sorts of things that uh, while we could do before um, will be much easier to do with this new user interface. Um, so we did just receive additional funding, we haven't officially announced it yet but um, that'll be coming very soon and as part of the next phase, which will be over the next two years, uh, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of really interesting things. Um, it, mainly we're focusing on sustainability though. We really want to make sure this thing will be sustainable long term. We're doing some maintenance and um, ensuring that um, the code base is, is really long term sustainable and the organization supporting it is as well. But we're also going to add an Android emulator. We're looking at doing um, networked environments in Easy, so you can run two environments, or three or four or five environments together as a single object and have it start and um, run um, together and isolated from the rest of the internet. So if you need a web server and a database and a front end, you could run them all as a single object. And we're also, I think one of the most interesting things is going to be automated um, interactions with environments via an API. So we can uh, enable you to use mouse and keyboard commands to interact with environments and to um, and you'll be able to record the results of that and analyze those to do all sorts of really interesting things. It's kind of like um, distant reading of, of software environments, but also you could do things like, uh, what were we thinking of recently? Oh yeah, analyze interactions users have with environments to see what common um, ways they have of using the legacy software so that we could potentially learn from that to add buttons to the interface to enable users to do things like zoom in on an AutoCAD for DOS um, document um, by clicking a button rather than having to try and figure out how the interface worked, which might be difficult for older software. Um, I, not entirely sure where I am with time, but um, this is a very brief demo of the network environments functionality. So what we're seeing is um, Windows Server 2003, and it's got a bunch of software installed on it, a um, database and SharePoint, and Office and various other things. And that's actually networked to a, I think Windows XP instance, running Internet Explorer 6. And you can see we're switching to that one there. And here you can see it's already uh, linked through to the um, SharePoint server. And you can see it just works. So this will be a way to uh, save potentially entire um, EDR messes or say Lotus Notes instances or um, anything web based. You could save the entire servers, old databases, you know, SQL, Oracle, anything like that, uh, which is, potentially also really transformative because it gives you new options of archiving these really quite complex things that are, would otherwise take an awful lot of time to migrate out of um, in order to save the components individually. So if you want to get involved with this, uh, we are exploring options in Australia at the moment in general, um, but here's a number of things you can do on here. Download and try any emulator. Um, there's a sandbox online that you can try that's um, a bit 
out of date right now, but it's still functional and it has a lot of open source software in it. You can try the demonstration Docker package, which I showed to uh, a whole bunch of people earlier this year in uh, Wellington. Um, join the Software Preservation Network. We're an affiliated project of the Software Preservation Network and it's an organization that's trying to um, enable software preservation globally. Um, and they're doing some really good work and they're looking to do more internationally as well. They're mostly Americans, but there's other international people involved in that and organizations. Contribute software metadata to Wikidata and um, advocate for software preservation locally. And um, particularly, we're really interested in ensuring we can do this kind of sharing that we're doing in America and easy right now internationally. So if there's anything that can be done to establish a legal basis for reuse of legacy software in Australia or in New Zealand or anywhere in Australasia, um, that is probably the highest priority thing right now because we're definitely making progress on the technical side. And if you want to connect with us directly, there's the email there. It's easy at yale.edu. That's our team. Thanks to the funders and thank you all. Thanks, Ewan. Very comprehensive overview. And we are going to roll right along to Melanie, who's up next. Melanie, are you with us? You okay to go? I am. Hey, <laughs> over to you. All right. Share my slides. Can you see that? Got it. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, we've got two new projects that I'm going to be talking about today, Play It Again and Archiving Australian Media Arts. They are both ARC linkage projects, so they're collaborations with industry partners, very multidisciplinary undertakings. Uh, I introduced these projects uh, at Oz Preserves last June, so this is really just an update to show how we're using emulation and how we're envisaging emulation in Australia in the future too, just to make a little segue there from Ewan's handover. So um, the main team um, consists of, if we can just go down, uh, Helen Stuckey, Denise DeVries, Cindy Moyer and myself, plus Angela Dalianis uh, on the Play It Again project. Full roll call of the team would take quite a while, but here's a rough breakdown of Play It Again and I'll tell you about the Media Arts project in a few minutes. So Play It Again 2, uh, we started in March. So far we've been working to purchase copies of the game titles on our target list, which consists of around rough, roughly 50 titles. Um, here's a, a, a grab from our, spread, our master spreadsheet, which is showing kind of where we're up to with, um, you know, uh, collecting materials, imaging the discs, getting them to emulate, etc. cetera. Um, and getting a range of emulators that the games require set up within emulation as a service. So, so far we've got, for instance, you know, DOS, Windows 95, 98, a few different Mac versions, um, Amiga, etc. We're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Cindy Moyer working with us on this, formerly of Living Computers Museum in Seattle. And Cindy has um, some good experience working with emulation as a service and has been involved with the software preservation networks, fostering a community of practice project around use of emulation as a service and easy in the US. Um, so uh, she's been uh, having a lot of fun playing around with emulators and getting games running in them um, and making videos which she's been uploading to our Vimeo channel, uh, which we'll be able to find. Um, and recently she's been um, noticing that, you know, as she's getting beyond the um, technical struggles of getting the emulators into emulation as a service and the tools, um, et cetera, she started to notice some differences around uh, timing and aspect ratios and those kinds of things. So um, I thought I would just show you a couple of examples that Cindy's grabbed for me uh, that we're currently uh, looking at. So here's a, um, a split screen view comparing um, international cricket from 1992, an NES game, um, played on two different emulators, uh, Mednafen and Messen, and you can see that it is not looking so great in the one on the left. Um, also, most recently, um, she's been having a play with a game from 1996, a PC game called Crazy Ivan. And here's a couple of side-by-side -side stills from the opening animation. Uh, on the left, emulation as a service running QEMU, and on the right, virtual box and you can have a look at the full video. I didn't think I'd try to stream video because um, 
Australian internet being what it is. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really evident when you get the skin tones uh, in this animation, you can really notice the difference. Um, so I'm not going to attempt to answer your questions about the technical side of emulation. I'm the humanities project person. Um, but hopefully we have both Cindy Moyer and Denise DeFries here who will be happy to answer any of your more clearly technical questions if you'd like to um, post them in the box. So it's important that we do this work now and I think these um, differences in the rendering really give us a, a glimpse into um, the timeliness of this project and the urgency. We need to do it, I would argue, while we can also run the artifacts on original hardware to see how they should look and behave. And this is where we're at with that at the moment. We are just in the process of setting up um, the Digital Heritage Lab full of equipment uh, at Swinburne Uni. That's uh, just arrived um, the week before last from Flinders Uni, where Denise had it set up there. So we have lots of boxes to unpack. If you want to come and lend a hand, feel free when we can all get back onto campus again. On to the second project. Um, this is what Australia's recent digital art history looks like. Uh, these are items from um, Experimenta Media Arts Archive. Uh, Experimenta being the Melbourne-based uh, media arts uh, group that began in the 80s as a, as a filmmaking uh, enterprise. Um, and this is not at all unusual, uh, you know, boxes of discs in a cupboard um, and no way to access them at the moment. Um, mostly 1990s material, but there is some 1980s material. Um, this is basically the problem of media arts, as I've stated it before. Um, and, you know, this is really quite uh, disturbing and an urgent situation that needs remedying because Australia really was, as Lisa Shelton expressed it to me in an interview, um, at the forefront internationally in the development of media arts. Um, people who perhaps aren't expert in the area might not know this, but our recent digital art history is esteemed incredibly overseas, but we don't have access to it, so we can't teach it. And you know, you run the risk of people reinventing wheels, obviously. So, Arguably, with these two projects, I would say um, it's kind of a moment when games and media arts come together. And I want to kind of just throw in this uh, uh, shout out to uh, this project that uh, Corey Archangel did with the Carnegie Mellon Computer Club in bringing back Andy Warhol's slides, um, sorry, images uh, from the um, Amiga computer launch that he did uh, in the 80s. Just like that club, we're using skills, technologies and know-how that's been developed um, often in relation to games preservation to recover Australia's media arts heritage. And it can, you know, obviously apply uh, beyond that as well. So th there's lots of narratives I could weave around this material. Um, but what's not at issue is that emulation has great potential for making currently inaccessible complex digital artifacts, including artworks, accessible once more. So we're stepping through the early stages of this project, which um, just began officially in May. Though fortunately, we held a team meeting um, last November in Sydney before everything went pear-shaped with the pandemic. So um, this is the team, uh, almost the whole team, minus Cindy, and um, the organisations involved. So you can see it's quite a large consortium. Uh, we're currently auditing media, uh, getting discs imaged, uh, and preparing a schedule of permissions that we're going to be asking artists for in order to emulate their work. So the project is called Archiving Australian Media Arts uh, Towards a Method and a National Collection. And I just want to spend a few minutes talking about that. These are the collections that we're working with. And arguably, um, these collections form a distributed national collection um, on their own. But like also then if you take into account what else uh, is out there in people's collections of media arts. Um, so, so in this project we have um, <coughs> Experimenta, uh, Griffith University Art Museum's uh, collections of CD-ROM art. Um, uh, this is on the left the um, part of the Deluxe Media Arts collection which is at Art Gallery of New South Wales. And the State Library of South Australia 
who has um, the Australian Network for Art and Technology uh, collections, and which are on the next slide, I think, and also um, Stan Ostoyakotkowski's uh, collections. This is the ANAT uh, archive prior to its transfer um, to, to the State Library. So um, these are the aims of this ARMA project. <coughs> um, and yes, we're going to be emulating them. Um, yes, we're going to be investigating contemporary exhibition and display. But what's not really articulated here that's kind of in the in-between of these aims is that there's a bit of a challenge of bringing these different collections together in some way. I think a bit of a challenge to the way that we think of collections going forward. And we're also doing a survey of media arts holdings in organisations around Australia. Um, collections become national in scale, at least, I would say, contextualised and augmented by artefacts that are held elsewhere. You know, so it really makes sense to hold the Deluxe collection together with the Experimenter collection, together with the Anak collection and the Griffith collection, which was Griffith artworks for people who know the Brisbane art history. Um, you know, and, and, and somehow, you know, they make more sense in each other's company and they are part of a whole. And, they, and there are more works out there as well that are probably held in collections that we, that we need to know about. Um, and that's the purpose of the, of the survey we're hoping to be able to display. Um, the results of uh, people's um, you know, spreadsheets that they send us as a, as a database on our website before too long. Um, it's, it seems to me like a, a new collections paradigm in a way that is uh, incipient, that's, that's waiting, waiting to be sort of brought forth. And there's a strong link here, I would argue, back to easy. Because thinking about collections as distributed around, around a range of institutions nationally really begs the question of how you might join them up. How can you know what's there and what might uh, be shared and accessed and lent across and between institutional and state boundaries? You know, so it starts to uh, take on um, quite a different uh, sense of, of what's there in the, in the national collection. And I think um, at the moment where we're all working from home, at least in Victoria, um, it, you know, this has a, an extra kind of resonance in, to researchers in the age of corona, because we start to think, well, how might we be able to access things remotely? But I think um, it's not just uh, pandemic times that this is relevant to, you know, increasingly, um, we're in a world where we need to rethink how much we travel in order to um, access our research materials and, the need is there to start to constrain our carbon footprints. This is already happening. My university, for instance, has committed to being carbon neutral by 2025. So I would argue that that's why we need an Australian easy network, like Ewan has been setting up in the US, uh, to enable sharing of environments, but also access to artefacts that are held elsewhere. And I'm currently spearheading a bid to the ARDC platforms program called Australian Easy, emulating legacy computer software and environments. And there's significant interest in setting up a network in Australia to facilitate access and sharing of collection objects that require emulation. So I'll circulate the expression of interest on the listserv after this. Uh, and I'd invite you to get in touch if you'd like to join in the bid, uh, which I'll be pulling together over the next month or so, either as a researcher or as an organisation that is keen to uh, get its content emulated and available in a national network. Um, I also have PhD scholarships available for students to work on both of these projects. So um, do be in touch or send anyone who's that way inclined um, my way. Thanks very much. Thanks, Melanie. So many opportunities and this is ripe for discussion when we get to it. For now, moving along, Tim, you're up, ready to go? Yes, nearly ready to go. Mel, can you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Okay. All right. Let me try and share my screen now. So, all right. Everyone can see that, I hope. Got it. Okay, great. Um, so, my name is Tim Mifsud. I'm from the National Archives of Australia. Uh, I um, have, um, I'm a bit of a fan of Zoolander, as you can see. I always think of digital preservation and digital archiving, and I think of this scene. Um, I'm a sucker for a good meme, so long may the animated GIF live. Today, though, I won't be looking at animated GIFs as much as um, 
digital objects that are dynamic. I mean, GIFs are a little bit dynamic, but not as much as the ones we're concerned about at the National Archives, um, such as executables and databases um, and objects which rely on um, outdated platforms to render their original form. So uh, maybe somewhere in the middle, I might be, uh, take a risk and um, try and show you uh, something I was using to um, test emulation as a strategy for the National Archives. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. And here we go. Okay, so the National Archives vision is to be one of the world's leading archives in the digital age. Um, to achieve this vision, um, a permanent section known as uh, the Digital Archives Innovation and Research um, section was established on the 1st of July 2020 out of the Digital Archives Task Force, which is to assist with meeting the enterprise strategy to innovate and develop our capacity to lead in the information age. Now, one of the problems this section is tasked with investigating is how can the National Archives meet its legal obligations under the Archives Act 1983 which is to provide access to hundreds of digital files in the digital archive that cannot be accessed in the um, archive's current computer environment. The reason they cannot be accessed um, is either because they're encoded in obsolete formats or because they are complex or dynamic digital objects such as executables that cannot be opened in a standard desktop environment. Um, and in some cases, these digital records are encoded in formats that Preservica, which the archives is currently testing as well, or the associated droid can't identify. So what I was tasked with doing when I was part of the Digital Archives Task Force, um, which turned into the DARE, Digital Archives Innovation and Research, um, was to research what we could do for this problem. Um, so I wrote up an internal discussion paper uh, called it Executing the Executable. Um, and I quickly identified in my research the Emulation as a Service Infrastructure program of work. Um, so we've heard a lot from Ewan about that, so I won't go too far into that. But um, what I found was that uh, the, the Easy crew were running a workshop in Dublin in February, luckily just prior to the pandemic. Um, and I was encouraged to go. So I did, and I made contact with um, Ethan there, and, um, and I had a lot of fun. I must stress at this point that uh, I'm not a, an IT person, nor am I an archivist. I'm an arts degree of nearly 20 years, um, but I'm interested in the problem. And I'm determined when learning what I need to do to get the job done. Um, so after my trip to Dublin, I managed to obtain a local copy of, the, uh, of Ease, and I loaded it into my own personal machine and started testing it out. Um, the reason I began with my own machine was due to resourcing and um, a few other hurdles um, in terms of getting a machine, but that's another story. Uh, anyway, I had, I had a few headaches along the way in getting it working. Um, as you and kind of alluded to, when you start with ease and you're not really familiar, it takes a lot of effort to get, the, um, get all the software together. But um, I had some assistance, thanks to, to both you and Ethan and, and Klaus via Twitter. I, I probably um, moaned a little bit on Twitter and I, I got some assistance that way. So it works. So thank you. Uh, but I f after I got it working, I found that, you know, it was pretty straightforward. And if a non-IT person like me can uh, make it work in Windows 10 Pro with Docker, um, which I have no idea how to use properly, apart from the instructions that was given to me by Easy, um, it must be fairly straightforward. So from here, once I had it going, I went on a little internal virtual Microsoft Teams roadshow due to COVID, I had to do it into, uh, virtually. And I showed all my colleagues um, how the local copy works on my machine. Um, I showed our director general, David Fricker, using eTax, which I'll hopefully show you soon. And he was so impressed that he encouraged the DARE to continue for a way to find a, a, um, a use for it. So. I had to use non-collection material. Actually, what I started with, I won't show you that today, was my um, geography assignments from year 11. Um, and that was quite entertaining um, on glaciers. Uh, but it was a bit of a trip down memory lane. The first thing I got to work was actually um, Doom. It was the only thing I had as an executable to make it work, but eventually I found something else. Um, and the other reason I had to use non-collection items was because all of the items in the digital archive uh, not yet examined and I wasn't going to wait the 90 days for that to happen. 
And besides that, they wouldn't have been able to examine them anyway because they wouldn't have had the tools necessary to open them securely. So I found eTax, which was a good candidate. I found it online. It's not in the collection as well. It wasn't, it may be all be in the collection. I haven't had a chance to look yet, but it, it was a published executable. So, um, and it was produced by the Commonwealth. So it was a very good candidate to sort of demonstrate our, our use case. And so what it really excited the archives about the prospect of um, the infrastructure side, as um, Ewan sort of alluded to, was it meant saving a lot of time and resources um, creating emulated environments. It took me a long time, although it was a lot of fun to create environments while I was stuck at home um, in my room here. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was something that was uh, beneficial to us if we thought we could share some of the environments we created and also um, maybe get access to some of the environments other institutions create. So as a result of my internal demo, um, it became a proper project in July 2020. It was sort of something that uh, was a side thing and in, in the, it wasn't really the focus of the task force. Um, that was really more to do with getting a, a, a system for us to actually get access to our digital uh, records or at least store them properly. But um, it was a question raised, so it was something I looked into. And anyway, it became a proper project. And I've kind of handed that off now um, to my colleagues in the DARE because I've switched jobs. So this is sort of me tying up a few loose ends and presenting. Um, I've moved into the policy area, but still something that I can work with and actually a very great interest to um, government agencies that we might be able to use this possibly, maybe we'll see in government agencies. Um, so look, maybe now I'll try my best to do something risky and I will just stop sharing and I'll jump out and I'm going to do, I'm going to show you, hang on a minute. I'll share my screen again. Hopefully it's working still. It did die just a moment ago. All right. So I'm hoping you can see this. This is me running ease right now on my machine. Um, and this is eTax. Um, so I already preloaded it and this is what it looked like in 1999 running in windows 98. Um, so this is a live version, here we go. Uh, so basically what you, you do, the reason why I would run this is for us at the National Archives, there's no way we could open this necessarily um, without having access to something, an emulation system. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't know what's inside that file. We wouldn't know how, what the government was asking of you in your tax pack of 1999. And it's significant because this was the first time that the government had switched over to, um, using an electronic form of submitting your tax return. Um, and yeah, you can just type in the tax. Uh, let's see if we can get this one right. Oh, tax. And then I can just type in any old number as long as it's like uh, 789, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3. Hopefully that worked. No, didn't work. Ah, this is this. The joys of doing this live. Hang on. Let's try that again. All right, let's try. And chase the mouse across the screen. And next. And here we go. So now you can kind of see what they're asking of you in your e-tax. Um, and that was rather impressive, I think, to our to the archives for us to know that look, you wouldn't get access to that at all or know what was being told to people back in 99 unless you could open that um, dot exe on your computer. Um, and Michael Carmody and his signature and so forth. So yeah, and then you can start your tax. And the great thing is it sort of shows you how everything is interactive and you click through and there's even, you know, the way they built it back then um, when you roll out, excuse me, um, little pop-ups to tell you what to do next. So yeah, there you go. That's sort of e-tax. Um, and I, I mean, I wouldn't show you any more than that. I don't have the tax return to give back in 1999, but um, anyway, that's what it looks like. So let me just stop sharing now. Go back to my slides. There we go. Okay. So um, the purpose of this project really is right now, uh, we have an internal business case up for approval at the National Archives. And the aim is to cement that project into an, inter into an internal structure and find a way to set it up on premise um, for continued testing on collection items. Um, the National Archives, we have to test these things, make sure that they're okay for us to use. Um, we want to, we might look at other systems if they're available, but at this stage, um, Ease and Easy seems to be the most mature 
um, but we, we can't necessarily be seen to be endorsing anything at this point in time. But we're really keen about it and we're going to test it out. So we'll see how we go. And to do that, we're going to have to join the Software Preservation Network, which is about 5,000 US a year, uh, but we're pretty keen on doing that. Uh, we'll see how we go from there. So as, a, as you can kind of see, look, there are a number of use cases for, of emulate, for emulation at the archives. Um, accessing obsolete digital files in the native computer environment, we've kind of seen that. Um, we have actually a lot of uh, files in our digital archive, like uh, Lotus Notes formats, which can't be opened in current environments. We've got um, a Harvard graphics presentation formats, um, which can't be identified by tools like Droid or Siegfried. Um, and really the use case right now is just that we've got all these files that we want to be able to know what they are and we can't open them in our current computer environment. And this is a nice safe way for us to, to actually inspect what we've got. Um, so it would help us with enabling effective description, uh, control and management of our software and legacy databases. So given we are a national archive, we would like to think about maybe um, exploring the idea of setting up ease on our internal network so that uh, even putting it on one of our internal servers so that staff in our state offices can have access because that's how we work. We do have uh, records across the country um, and you know, as opposed to having it installed only on non-network machines at this stage, although we may op we probably will operate in that capacity as well. Okay, so what's next? Um, you can see there's a nice slide there of uh, something I found when I first got Windows 3.1 running and laughed my head off when I saw the Windows mouse tutorial. Um, it's such a great rundown memory lane. The reason I went for those sorts of setups was because I was familiar with them. They were from my first computer systems when I was 15, 16 years old. Um, anyway, apart from getting this project off the ground internally, the archives is already thinking ahead to what's next. And um, that includes engaging with potential users of e-software such as Swinburne University, who kindly included the archives as a supporter of the ARDC grant submission, seeking funding to set up an infrastructure node for ease within Australia. The advantage of this would um, be for us to have partners in the grant and that would be to share in the resources um, such as sharing software environments via EASY. Um, now, once things are up and running, the real work will begin. There's a good deal of material in our digital archive there ready to be worked on. And I don't see this as a problem that's going to go away. Um, the National Archives year on year receives more and more digital objects and we're pushing our agencies to continue to um, transfer to us in a digital form um, as best as they can. And the, the real problem comes when we find that um, it, sometimes it's 15 years before they transfer. And in that time, um, those objects could very well have already become out obsolete or outdated. So it's about us finding mitigating strategies um, to help our agencies with preserving the items while they're in their custody. And sometimes they may even keep them longer than 15 years, although we encourage them to transfer at that time. Um, and maybe emulation is a possible strategy that we would be interested in encouraging our Commonwealth agencies to look at as well. Um, so that helps them get access to their materials again uh, when they need them. So I think that's my slides and I will stop sharing now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. That is incredibly proactive work and I love how you situated it in, in the context of the National Archives of Australia work. Thank you so much. I think we are up to Gareth, our last but not least speaker. Um, hello everyone, my name is Gareth. Um, I'm talking to you from the National Library. I've been uh, working in digital preservation for the last seven years and it's about time that I started talking on this platform. Forgive my nerves, this is the first time. Um, and the disadvantage of presenting last is that horrible realization that I could have included much more interesting slides and demos in this talk, um, but that can always be arranged privately. Um, today, I'm going to take you through um, a closer look at our um, software and hardware library, um, but more so the, the software component of our library, um, and talk to you about um, what we're doing uh, with the software that's in our library, how it's introduced us to virtualization, um, and how we work with virtualization, um, and then just to talk about um, future applications 
um, of, of the software that we have built or that we've um, processed. Um, the software and hardware library at the National Library, uh, I, I suppose, was formed privately um, in the early 2000s, uh, former colleagues uh, donating uh, from their own personal collections, uh, encouraging others uh, to do likewise. Um, back in the day when um, I suppose people didn't truly know uh, what they were collecting, uh, so it was a just in case mentality, collecting a bit of everything. Uh, so today we have in our collection over 3,600 items, possibly more, um, including uh, software, computers, hardware, periphery, um, and uh, another library of books and, and user manuals. Um, so with the software, we have uh, close to 1,700 catalogued uh, software applications. I should say that the hardware and computers are also catalogued. Um, so 1,700 um, different software applications, uh, many interesting titles uh, included. Um, I don't know if you can see um, that we have um, a very early version of Windows there, but it's not just that. Um, to give you an idea of the date range, we have applications going back um, to 1980, um, but the majority of our collection uh, is in the in the 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, I also have a backlog of uncatalogued software that I have harvested from the internet over the last few years, which would push that number up to uh, the more modern uh, timeline. Um, that's a project in itself. Um, Carrier-wise, um, it's a, a split between uh, three and a half inch floppy disks and CD-ROMs. Uh, not everything in the catalogue has a carrier type or a number entry against it. Uh, we're still working on improving the catalogue, uh, but the majority are three and a half inch and uh, CD-ROMs. Um, as for the software um, categories, we have um, a large number of utilities, uh, your typical business productivity uh, software, um, operating systems, um, graphic design image uh, and multimedia. Um, with the operating system, uh, the platforms are predominantly Windows and, and Macintosh, Mac OS um, and Mac OS X, um, with, with a few other operating systems in there. Uh, we have a, a fairly complete uh, collection of Windows operating systems and an almost complete um, collection of Mac OS, Mac OS X. Um, of course, with all this software on carriers, what do we do? We disk image it. That's got to practice what we preach. Uh, so back in 2012, I think it was 2012, uh, we organized a volunteer to come in uh, three hours a week to start to uh, disk image uh, the software. And by 2017, the majority of the software um, has been disk imaged. Uh, we used uh, DD, uh, Cat Weasel, uh, DD for three and a half inch disks, Cat Weasel for five and a quarters. Cat Weasel unfortunately died, so there's still a small collection of five and a quarters that we need to um, process. And for the, the CD-ROMs and DVDs, uh, we predominantly used uh, IMG Burn. So, uh, what are we doing with all this software? Uh, it wasn't until we started the file format and software mapping project uh, that we started to utilize uh, this software. Um, Ewan's would be interested in this. This is, uh, and we, you probably already know about it, and I won't go into too much detail about it as um, we've written an article about it and we've presented it at iPres, and I will uh, share some links um, for anyone who is interested in reading about this. Uh, but essentially the, um, the file format software mapping project um, is um, a knowledge base um, that's looking at the relationships between uh, file formats and software. So it's what Ewan uh, was talking about with their documentation, uh, but we go into a, just a tiny bit more detail in, in terms of um, functional relationships between file formats and software. Um, back in the early days, of course, um, when this project started, we were looking at vendor docu documentation online to get that information. Um, but as you know, vendor, vendor documentation is not always accurate or not even there. Sometimes they don't even uh, disclose that information. Um, so we started to actually utilize the software in our software library. 
it's right there, <laughs> why not? Um, but, um, and I'm not an IT background as well, um, so I started to install software on modern operating systems, older applications on modern operating systems and quickly ran into a whole world of trouble. Um, and I'm actually quite grateful um, that my ignorance led me to realize this because I'll give you an example. Um, I was trying to get information out of an earlier version of Microsoft Word and I had installed it on um, uh, the, um, a working computer at the National Library that I think had another version of uh, Microsoft Word, uh, uh, my, uh, Word 2010, for example. And I successfully installed, um, I think it was a, a Word 97 version onto the computer. But because of common libraries, um, we got interference. Uh, the Word version of two, uh, Word 2010 had contaminated the Word 97 and all of a sudden Word 97 could read um, and save open XML. Um, so that led me to realize that what I was doing was not right and IT um, happily stepped in and introduced me um, to VMware. So it introduced me to virtualization. And to be honest, I haven't looked back. Um, I'm very grateful of my mistakes in the past uh, to learn new things. And with virtualization, not emulation, <coughs> though there are overlaps, there are some slight differences, but with virtualization, um, I very quickly uh, started to set up uh, virtual machines for every single um, Windows operating system uh, that we had, which is actually all of them. Um, and then it was just a simple matter of installing whichever um, software application I was looking at um, into its own um, instance of that virtual machine and create a snapshot, which is what you can see here. So these little uh, snapshots here allow me to jump from Microsoft Word 1 to PowerPoint 4 to Acrobat 1. Um, and they are all in their pristine um, environments. There are no other um, software applications installed on those snapshots. So that um, allowed me to do the mapping work um, as accurately as possible and with the convenience of, of doing this all from one computer rather than trying to build um, a computer with hardware and, and to install software the old-fashioned way. Uh, this is just a, um, an idea of all of the the Windows operating systems that we have. This would be great for a demo, as I can easily jump to um, Windows 1 or to, you know, to Windows 10. We do have um, older uh, DOS versions um, in our environments too, and I think Linux is there. Macintosh, uh, not supported, but we do have some emulators um, for, for Mac OS as well. Um, <clears throat> so it's not just the file format and mapping um, research that we're doing. We're also um, using our virtual machines um, to do everyday digital preservation. Um, and just to give you a bit of context, we've had um, Preservica now since up and running since uh, 2016 with um, e-deposit flowing into that um, late 2016. Uh, so we have been actively analyzing um, all of this content uh, for many years now and the virtual machines that we have set up um, are an everyday part of that process. So we predominantly use um, virtual machines to help with the identification of files that haven't been identified correctly or not identified by Droid or misidentified um, as, a, as Droid is still not um, accurate and we, and we do do a lot of work in improving its accuracy. Um, but um, in part of that process is, of course, looking at, at software that could help us to, to come to an identification and we uh, simply throw that software, which is often legacy, um, into um, a virtual machine to do the work. Um, we also look at rendering issues, um, which um, presenters have touched upon as well. Uh, we have some, once again, an, another opportunity to have a demonstration about some of the rendering issues that we've come across, including uh, PowerPoint works uh, and a few others. 
uh, and that's where we we look at earlier versions, um, legacy versions of particular software um, in a in a virtual machine to to have a look at what the rendering issues are. Um, and we also use it for processing our offline carriers, what we call offline carriers. Um, and offline carriers are before uh, legal deposit um, was updated to include electronic publications. Uh, vendors would voluntarily um, supply the National Library with uh, to deposit um, electronic publications on CDs um, to the National Library before it became mandatory. And so we're now in the process of ingesting that content into Preservica. Uh, a lot of the content uh, isn't straightforward though. Um, they are complex digital objects that um, <clears throat> either have uh, software or they're, bundled, they're a uh, software database application uh, or they have um, their own custom uh, software that re is required for rendering. So what we do is we um, fire that up in a virtual machine test that everything works before ingest. A lot of the time, or sometimes, um, what we get is corrupted um, and where we can then uh, not ingest, but rather work with collection areas um, to seek another copy or to find an alternative um, solution. Um, so the future, sorry, I have flown through this presentation. Um, where we're at, I think we're a very comfortable position uh, to talk about emulation or to, to, to consider imp, um, implementing some kind of emulation solution for access um, and delivery uh, to users in the future. Um, we have this large uh, software library to utilize. We have uh, disk imaged almost everything and we now have ongoing experience um, with older applications and software uh, and operating systems. We still need to look at the uh, licensing issue and the legality of, of emulation or even sharing um, um, software. Uh, so that's uh, where we're at. And uh, yes, thank you. Thanks, Gareth. You know, now that you've spoken so eloquently, you're gonna be asked back to Australasia Preserve. Huh. So it's all very much appreciated it's so good seeing people who are actually taking steps in this field and learning from your experiences so i'm going to launch this poll while i get myself organized for question and discussion time i couldn't help myself when i saw gifs and gifs come up so we've had quite a few questions come through i've kind of been trying to keep track of them you and i might start with you dave's got a couple of questions for you I'm going to pop them in the chat box so you can think about them as we all participate in this fun poll. And people, if you want to try turning your videos on now, it'd be great to see faces. We'll see how we go with the bandwidth. Subscription-based software. Um, it's a good question. We don't actually have a solution right now. I think it's a great area to do research in. What I have heard is that um, some web-based services like um, Gmail or Facebook, or I don't know, maybe Spotify, at least one of them, someone at one of them has said they've been able to resurrect and they have on a regular basis resurrected um, previous versions of those services. Um, so th it's technically possible, I believe, which I, other people would suggest would be impossible. Um, but uh, the other thing we can do in America at the moment under, um, the uh, exemptions for the DMCA exemptions that the Software Preservation Network has been working to extend is um, break DRM. So if you can download a local copy of say um, Adobe and install it and then crack the DRM on it and keep it running, uh, then we can keep it running. Um, so for anything that you can download locally, we can do that. Uh, premise emits file and extract the software dependencies from the premise to create the emulation environment on the fly. Um, yeah, we are, um, so with the UVI, it's really a metadata driven tool. Uh, and so this is only one part of this, but if the, the premise record had the information that we use in the API to match the object to the um, uh, environments that can, uh, you can interact with it in, then yeah, we could just pull it directly out of there. We are standardizing that API and we're standardizing the metadata that we're creating in various ways uh, and more uh, documentation on that will come out in the future. 
Uh, and there's another project I'm working on, which we haven't really published anything about yet, which is um, we're working with Richard Lahane and um, it's mainly Ross Spencer who's on this call, I believe, um, who's doing work to improve SIGPRE to make it be able to pull information from Wikidata directly, so signatures, and um, report back Wikidata IDs. Um, and uh, part of the idea behind that is we hope someday we'll be able to match directly to a signature that would um, identify the at least the creating application. Um, and so if that if SIGFREE could be run over everything going into an archive, say, then we might get enough information out of that to be able to match automatically then to the um, environments that you can interact with those objects in, which would just be great. So you wouldn't even need to have access to easy, but you could say this environment would run in this, env uh, sorry, this object would be able to be interacted with in this environment in easy because we've already done the matching when we ingested the thing. Thanks, Ewan. I want to pick up, actually, is anyone else as interested as me in these poll results? I don't know. I'm just a sucker for a good poll. I don't know. Do we expect that? Share in the chat your thoughts on that, uh, that high winner. <laughs> There's some yays. Okay, I want to pick up on uh, Kimberly's question. Kimberly, this is a great question. How can we, as collecting institutions, ensure that we are capturing and securing the artistic author intent as we emulate, migrate, normalize objects as part of ongoing digital preservation practices? So Melanie, I see you did put a bit of an answer in there. Uh, many use interviews and surveys at the time of work entering the institution, but I wonder, Tim, you and Gareth, any thoughts on this from your perspectives to add? I might jump in, actually. Um, so one of the things that, well, for a use case for the National Archives, it's, it's really important for us to be able to get access to the materials in their original environments because one of the strategies we've used previously is to, to migrate. But um, how do you know if you've migrated correctly? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, because it, it could be rather intensive for us to continually create environments um, to show objects um, that probably don't need emulation necessarily to, to show them. It would probably be preferable to migrate some of those objects, but then how do you know you've migrated them correctly? Um, and I demonstrated that perfectly um, with my geography assignment um, where I created that geography assignment in, um, in Microsoft Works. And when you try and open it at the moment, it just looks like text, um, but, putting it into its original environment with running the original Microsoft works. I got back all of the, um, the images I'd stolen from Microsoft in Carter when I was in, um, you know, 16 years old and I, I, you just don't get that otherwise. And there was no way that you'd be able to show that unless you emulated first. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's almost a crucial thing that you need an emulator to verify that you've migrated correctly. One of the things I forgot to mention was with the ability to automatically interact with environments via an API that we're adding, um, it re-enables something that the Freiburg team demoed a few years ago, which is migration via emulation. Um, so you, I, I showed that with the, the UVI, but you can open a file in the original software and save it in a more modern or more open format, um, which would allow you to do migration on demand. Um, so most things in archives never get accessed ever. Um, so if you're migrating them just in case they're going to be accessed, it could be quite a uh, resource, like a bit of a waste of resources, but if you could uh, migrate them on demand, it might be a, um, more economic. And if you're going to keep the emulated environments around for emulation anyway, and that validation of the original context, um, then you could also, and if you could also then use it for migration, it seems like it's a win-win. I was, we've just had a meeting uh, last week with a working group from the Media Arts Project, uh, where we were discussing this question about um, permissions, I guess, and, and what, um, looking forward, we might uh, want to anticipate, um, you know, wanting to ask, say, an artist permission to do with um, a work that uh, was to be acquired. Um, you know, because in a, if you think back to the 80s, like, emulation wasn't something that was on people's radars and so that whole um, I think the phrase that um, has been floated is you know in formats known and unknown <laughs> so trying to anticipate the future you know what might you want to do with this in the future that you you want to um, perhaps uh, seek permission 
or advice on now. And of course, no one can have that crystal ball, but um, it's something that we're trying to, to um, I guess, uh, come up with an, a, a set of um, um, questions that we can uh, um, have as a template that can be a bolt on to institutions um, existing uh, deeds and you know, um, agreements that they present um, when someone, uh, when they're acquiring a work. So it can, uh, you know, offer a range of options, you know, so do you want to give permission to, to emulate, to exhibit an emulated version of the work, um, to, to share uh, across between institutions over a network such as EASY, for instance. You know, what about sharing on the internet? The reason I haven't shown any images is because I, had a, I don't have those permissions yet and I don't want to um, do that prematurely because I think it's really important, you know, artists get so little uh, back from um, making uh, this kind of work in most cases that uh, I'm not just going to add to, um, it, even though I could probably make a case in terms of, you know, for research purposes, it's, it's still, um, I'd rather clear those permissions first. So, um, you know, and then some people are really happy because they've grown up in a, a culture in which you grab content from everywhere and you remix it. So like, well, are people happy to have their work remixed? You know, I think all these things can be on the table, but um, it's best to be clear and to, to have them in a, in a, in a document where, where everyone's clear on what's been agreed to. So that's sort of where we're going with this. And we, we'll put that in our, our report and our standards document that we'll be producing at the end of the project so other people can, you know, adapt, uh, riff off these things, do whatever they want. Did you want to add anything to that, Gareth? Um, yeah, I just wanted to give an example of, so we we're talking about using emulation or virtualization to have a look at the, I suppose, the original look and feel of a, of a, a document or an artwork or whatever. I just wanted to give an example uh, that we came across last year, I think, of a WordPerfect 6 document that was positively identified by Droid. <clears throat> and when we looked at the, at the underlying bits, we confirmed that. But when we opened it um, in a Word uh, 2016 document, we noticed a number of rendering issues, uh, mainly uh, it was the slight um, issues with the layout and, and all of the embedded images were reversed, flipped and inverted in color. Um, so we went back into, um, we have um, a version of um, WordPerfect 6 for Windows. We threw that in the virtual machine and rendered it and it did an even worse job um, of what Word did. Um, and I, I scratched my head. I went further back looking at older versions of Word Perfect, um, didn't improve it, um, but delving into the underlying bits even more in the hex editor, it, it, we found out that there was some, comp um, some compiling code that indicated that it wasn't created in Word Perfect at all. Um, so another third party tool, um, which explained some of the rendering issues. So Emulation and virtualized and, and virtual machines, uh, I would say most of the time are gonna um, do a very good job of, of um, rendering the original look and feel, but not always. I just wanna jump in quickly. I've just pulled something up. If anyone wants to have a quick look, I can share my screen now. And I wanna show you just, this is what I was talking about before. Um, this will work. Can everyone see that? So this is the ge geography assignment that I made called Hazardous Geomorphic Processes About Glaciers. And what I was saying before, when I opened this up on my own desktop without needing easy, it just didn't produce. Um, and when I used easy, I got it back. And so this was made um, in 1995 or so, or a bit earlier than that. And that's how the image produces. So um, yeah, I mean, it, this is Windows 3.1, sorry, it's a bit clunky, but that's effectively what you get. Um, and you can really sort of interact with the document with all my spelling mistakes and so forth. So there you go, that's just what it kind of looked like. That's so fun to see, well done, Tim. And I forgot to mention A plus marks for doing a live demo. I mean, I, sh I should really applaud that. I think we should all applaud that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I've noted that Warwick asked a question, but he's just had to leave. And while I was multitasking, I'll pop it in the chat. This is Warwick's question he asked. Apologies if this has already been answered while I was multitasking. I haven't seen an answer, but for our speakers. 
What do you think of this question? It's really hard. <laughs> I've been actively looking at the moment on uh, trying to find good examples of when software puts something into a file to specify that it was the software that created it. And you, like even when that happens, which is not consistent, um, so it'll say like creating application was Word version blah blah blah, it often won't go into the details of that are specific enough to get like the updates are rated or add-ons is another one. So you might be relying on some, say, um, say in a word process, you might be relying on some um, equation editor that's been added onto the software um, that you might need to be able to open it or a font. There's a great paper at I think iPress 2009 about how important having the right fonts are to be able to um, open an object. And that kind of thing is not going to be um, captured in the, well, may not be captured in the file format in a way that is useful for automating this kind of um, this kind of work. So identifying the right software to open it in. It's a really tough problem. So one of the things I think where I sit now in my space uh, in the policy area is encouraging our government agencies to record metadata about these sorts of things as best as we can. So we'll be putting out a new policy shortly about um, what we want government agencies to do. Um, so one of those things would be hopefully what software did you use and what version was it and did you use any special plugins associated with it because once you capture that material and that information alongside the objects that they're transferring to us then that makes our jobs a lot easier when it comes to um, using emulation. I'm fascinated by the uh, conversation around Amy I think you started it off the legal issues around emulating proprietary software there's been a lot in the chat already about this. Tim, I see you've given a bit of an answer. Was there anything you wanted to expand on for everybody beyond the chat that you've, you've answered Amy's question there? Uh, so I'm no legal expert, first of all. Let's be put that out there. Um, and I guess, um, and also as my colleague Tatiana rightly pointed out, what we would be using it for mostly is um, to uh, use emulation to get access to Commonwealth created objects first and foremost. Um, if we happen to need to use something that is a, a proprietary system, uh, well, I would hope as Ewan rightly pointed out in Australia, we have fair use policy. So as a cultural institution, we might be able to draw on that as a possible legal crutch. We're not sure yet. We need to look into the question further. Um, and also why I've sold it is that if uh, we happen to be um, using your system, then you should be pleased. Maybe if we've had a chat with you, first of all, that um, your system's now interwoven into historical fabrics um, and you know, it becomes part of history. Uh, and also, I mean, the government probably would have paid for licensing in this first place. So you would hope um, that there shouldn't be an issue for us to continue using those those things if we paid for them in the first place. And we have probably our final question before we start wrapping up from Ingrid. Are these problems, for example, detecting which bits of software are missing research challenges that could be thrown at computer scientists? Great question. What do we think? I um, should have muted my mic, sorry, but um, I have a dream that we'll be able to do this, do some work on this with um, uh, the easy interaction API, because we could just try everything and see what happens. So what I mean is take instead of known files and open them in every single application and screenshot as we go, and then analyze the screenshots to see what worked um, using machine learning um, and, and do something like that, take an, an approach like that um, and do it at scale to try and figure out um, what does work. Um, and then also we could create um, example files that we know exactly what's in them and what did create them in order to try and identify signatures from within them um, using the same approach. So have some standard content that we then copy automatically into um, the original software and save as um, an example file with an, an identifier that we understand and then analyze those to try and find signatures in those. So I think this stuff that we can do with automation and machine learning that has some really exciting potential for the future. Any yep, go Thanks. ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, this is part of our project as well, trying to find 
what all their dependencies are, what the what the libraries are, what the DLLs are, what the extensions are, what third party um, software is, and try and examine the calls within the executable to find out exactly what is needed to be able to run any bit of software, to be able to open any bit of um, any digital object. I was just reminded when um, Ewan was talking in, um, for instance, the Microsoft Access 97 version, um, the registration of that didn't work unless you had a particular font installed on your computer. Um, you wouldn't think that there would be any link except they're both um, font, the, the font and access are created by Microsoft. And so it was sort of like a backdoor way of Microsoft making sure you had, you know, all the parts. And, you know, no matter how much investigation you did into either Microsoft Access or even um, a database, you wouldn't know that. I only got that information from Microsoft because my registration didn't work. So it's fraught with danger. Thanks, Denise. I think fraught with danger can be like the, uh, the article title for all of these interesting ideas that are coming together. Yeah. But I think our time is almost up. So please, virtual round of applause for our speakers. It was fantastic today. You and Melanie, Tim, Gareth, thank you so much. Uh, Matt, I think we've just got time. If people can stick around for a couple more minutes. We did a survey for monthly meet meeting topics on the Australasia Preserves Forum and Matt, I think you have a bit of a summary to share. Are you able to do that quickly now? Yes, I can. So hopefully everyone can see the slide. Um, so we surveyed members of the community um, for suggestions on future monthly meetup topics and activities, as well as to get an idea of where our members are from. So the survey was open for the month of July with 53 responses in total. So with around 360 members of the Google group, this is a response rate of about 15%, but also noting that the survey was shared publicly on Twitter. So 79% of respondents are from Australia with the remaining 20% from New Zealand and no respondents indicated that they were from another country, which was interesting. In terms of the monthly meetup topics, respondents were allowed to choose up to five predetermined topics for future monthly meetups. So the top six were digital preservation metadata standards and schema, digital preservation essentials overview, case studies, fail club, an unrecorded ad hoc discussion on what hasn't worked, storage strategies, how many copies do you have, and digital preservation for small nonprofit and community organizations. Respondents were also allowed to suggest topics with 17 responses in total. These were normalized where some used this for additional votes on the predetermined topics, which were added to those counts and 13 additional topics were suggested in total. So you can see here, there's quite a few different topics that we could also look at in the future. So there was one vote for each of the above, except for collaborative projects, which received two votes. Um, there were two responses indicating interest in presenting at future monthly meetups on some other topics as well. And lastly, 36.5% uh, of respondents indicated that they would be interested in a monthly journal or article book club. So the next steps will be the co-organizing group having a look at these results and discussing and planning for future events. And thank you everyone who took part in the survey. Thanks Matt, fantastic. It just kind of goes to show uh, what an engaged community we have and this is, seems to be growing week upon week. So thank you, everybody. Thank you again to our speakers. I will send around a link to this video when it's available and we'll be in touch about our next get together. Thanks everybody for today and see you in the next one.